And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Renee Bradshaw, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar, Managing Active Directory for Data Integrity and Security. Today, we are very excited to have as our guest speaker, Mr. Darren Marelia, a Microsoft MVP and group policy expert. But before getting into the agenda and introducing Darren formally, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. At the end of the presentation, we've set aside time for Q&A. We're looking forward to hearing from you, so please join us for that portion of the presentation. Also, shortly before we begin the, after we begin the Q&A session, you will have the opportunity to complete a survey and enter for a chance to win an Apple iPad 2. So you don't want to miss that opportunity, so please stick around. First on the agenda today, you'll hear from Darren. Darren's going to discuss why Active Directory is increasingly gaining importance as a point of control within your network and how this affects the way it must be managed and protected. He will delve into the types of data loss that can result from lack of Active Directory control and walk you through steps you can take to secure the identity data which resides with, within Active Directory. After we hear from Darren, I'll speak for a few minutes about some of the real-world consequences of a non-secure AD infrastructure and share how one organization is successfully deploying proven security controls to create that secure and compliant AD infrastructure we all want. And finally today, we will end the session with an informative Q&A and that chance to win the Apple iPad 2. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Darren Morelia. Darren Morelia has been a Microsoft MVP in the group policy area for the past six years and has more than 25 years of IT and software experience in the Microsoft technology area. Currently, Darren is president and CTO of SDM Software, that's a Windows management products company focusing on group policy solutions. Prior to SDM, he worked at Desktop Standard, which was acquired by Microsoft as Senior Director of Product Engineering. Darren maintains the popular group policy resource website at www.gpoguy.com and has been a contributing editor for Windows IT Pro Magazine since 1997. He's written and contributed to 12 books on Windows and enterprise networking pro topics. And now, without any further delay, I'll hand it over to Darren. Thanks, Renee, and thanks to everyone for uh, coming on today and taking time out of their busy schedules. I really appreciate it, and uh, just want to uh, start off by saying that even though folks know me as the, uh, the group policy guy, I've actually been working with Active Directory in a variety of environments for, um, I guess, since 1998, since a little bit before the product shipped. So um, I've gotten a lot of uh, real-world experience around AD um, and managing AD and working with AD, and I've seen it kind of evolve from what it was back then, which was really a, a, a network operating system directory for Windows desktops um, competing against the old netware world to, uh, to really becoming kind of a full-fledged uh, partner in most uh, organizations' identity landscapes. So uh, with that, I want to kind of dive in and talk a little bit about that. So um, what we've seen today is, and, and why it's important to think about uh, AD in kind of a different context from what we may have in the past, is that it's really become this kind of big player in a typical uh, organization's identity landscape. For, for some organizations, it's, it's probably the primary player, but for, for many, of course, it's, it's one of many places where identity is kept. And uh, it's certainly uh, used uh, to, to authenticate Windows desktops and increasingly other kinds of systems as well. And in fact, many app backend application services are now using AD for authentication authorization. Um, and, and in fact, it's, it's really not just Windows stuff anymore. It's really uh, increasingly Linux and Unix and Mac with third-party products that let you integrate those into Active Directory. Um, it's applications such as uh, web applications running on Java or uh, potentially you know, CRM applications. Uh, many, many different kinds of applications and systems um, are now uh, offering support for uh, native Active Directory, either integration or, or native authentication using Kerberos. So there's a lot um, of stuff that's increasingly going into Active Directory today. Um, and and that's, that makes it and its management extremely important for folks. So let's go ahead and, and shift gears and talk a little bit about the data loss risks and what's at stake. Um, because AD has become sort of a 
central point uh, of control for a lot of stuff and a lot of corporate data and even uh, sensitive corporate data is accessible through your AD credentials, um, the, the, the stakes are much higher in terms of you know, making sure that you've got the right folks getting access to the right data. And data loss, you know, either on purpose or inadvertently, um, as we've seen with you know, both publicized and probably in our own experiences not publicized um, issues with data loss, that, that those things can be pretty painful. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ramifications that I'll talk about in a little bit. Since AD provides authorization to resources, and, and you know, typically it's through security groups um, and, and the use of a group membership on those resources, but it could be other mechanisms that are being driven out of AD. Um, knowing who has access to what, what they're doing with that access is uh, increasingly becoming uh, sort of the, the main job of the Active Directory Administrator. And you know, sort of lack of control over AD. And, and you know, frankly, when, when AD started in, in this world, um, we, we weren't thinking so much about some of these high-profile issues because, again, it was really focused on getting access to um, Windows desktops, being able to log into my Windows desktops and access file shares and, and email and things like that. Uh, but because it's, it's increasingly being used for everything from access to business applications to sensitive data, um, the risks for data loss are much greater. Um, if, if a user is in the wrong group um, that is giving them access, let's say they change jobs and they got put from one group that's uh, less sensitive into another group that's more sensitive and they shouldn't be, that, um, that exposure, potential exposure to data is, is, um, is potentially critical for the organization. Terminated employees, another big problem in a lot of organizations, um, especially if um, you've got identities living in lots of different places in addition to AD. Um, when, a, when a user account gets terminated or when a user gets terminated, the, the importance of making sure that not only their AD account but any other access they have gets terminated is, is, is uh, the, the so-called deprovisioning problem is a super, super important to, to be able to get a handle on. Um, the last thing you want is somebody that's no longer an employee that still has a way of getting access to your corporate resources. Um, unauthorized users being able to add others into sensitive privileged groups. So in other words, not having really good control over your access controls that uh, control group membership and uh, having people that, um, you know, whether it be server administrators that get a call from their buddy that, oh, can I, can I get access to that group because I need to access so-and-so resources or groups or whatever. Um, that, that kind of unauthorized access to, to those privileged groups uh, becomes a problem. And, and then you know, this, this also extends into um, administrative access, so access to production servers and data. Um, the, this whole notion of least privilege has taken on a, a new sense of urgency because um, it's, it's just as bad if an administrator who has privileged access to a server goes and grants somebody else access to that server just because of convenience or whatever, and something happens to that production server. Um, those kinds of scenarios are just as bad as the data loss scenarios. And then uh, non-employees getting access to your network. So um, you know, guests coming onto your wireless network and having easy access into your corporate data uh, through um, lax at Active Directory controls. So all of these things um, are, are potential data loss risks that um, result when you, you really don't have a really good sense of what is going on in your Active Directory. In addition, you know, if AD is not properly protected, if AD itself is not properly permissioned and uh, access controls aren't um, consistently applied across all the different objects in AD, you, you, can, you can see a number of different data loss opportunities. So, um, information related to employees that maybe should not be public. Uh, a lot of folks use Active Directory not only to, to provide information about users that is generally public and, and not terribly protected, but also in some cases is protected um, and should be protected. And ensuring that the right security permissions are set on AD for access to those, those pieces of information, those attributes on objects is, is 
almost as critical as protecting the objects themselves. And you know, the ability to edit groups, if, we, if we've decided that Active Directory groups are the main way we authorize access to resources, things like mailboxes and file shares, databases, applications, whatever it happens to be, um, then the ability to control who can get into those groups and modify their membership lists is um, super critical. Uh, the ability to modify key AD configuration objects. You know, in a lot of cases, um, uh, most, most large organizations and even medium-sized organizations have change controls in place. Um, but in some cases, they don't include, uh, you know, typical Active Directory changes in those. I'll talk about a little bit more about this in a bit. But, you know, there are certain kinds of Active Directory changes that probably deserve to be controlled very tightly. And AD configuration changes, things like site objects or AD replication topology, are absolutely 100% uh, um, things that you want to have fall under the category of, um, I need to know about when it's happening. I need to know who did it. And I need to know what the change is. Ability to modify group policy objects. Um, you know, group policy is a technology that's near and dear to my heart. And one of the things that I've seen repeatedly is sort of group policy run amok, uh, where there aren't tight controls about who can change which group policy objects, uh, resulting in everything from you know, security compromises on servers that have been uh, hardened using group policy to uh, desktop systems that have been rendered unusable because of uh, inadvertent group policy changes. Uh, group policy is driven out of Active Directory. Its delegation model is controlled through Active Directory. So it's another area that we have to t pay attention to as we're, as we're thinking about you know, the data loss and the, and the uh, security risks around AD. You know, in terms of the threat vectors and, and the places where you know, poor control of AD can really bite us, um, you know, there's some obvious ones like uh, users trying to guess weak passwords. You know, putting security policies in place on AD so that I can't sit there with a dictionary cracker against my AD um, and, and be guessing passwords you know, for um, you know, five, six days in a row on a computer uh, without knowing about it, without having somebody um, seeing it in audit logs or without having it be um, detected through uh, account lockouts and things like that. So you know, the obvious stuff of, of making sure that security policies in are in place around your Active Directory. To, to less obvious things like um, exploiting service accounts. Um, this is a, a pretty common area where uh, a lot of shops sort of fall down because it's, it's frankly hard. Um, you've got a bunch of service accounts out there for applications. It's really painful to have to change the passwords on those service accounts because uh, the applications have to change and it can result in outages for those applications. And, and so the tendency is to leave these accounts in you know, password never expire mode. And in a lot of cases, the, pass or the accounts are privileged accounts. So how do you control who is using those accounts for reasons other than the application reason? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a common exploit and a common threat that you know, lack of good man management around these accounts can result in sort of you know, threats to your, uh, to your Active Directory data as well as other data. And again, I, I can't underscore enough the ability to modify group memberships uh, is a is a should be a very very restricted ability. That the um, that the presence of that capability, and uh, especially if those groups are accessing anything that's considered sensitive to the organization, is it should be very tightly controlled. And then you know querying unprotected AD information. Um, this goes back to what I was talking about related to you know, sort of the data that's in AD. Um, you know, by default, Microsoft puts you know, fairly lax or let's say um, uh, supportive uh, restrictions on AD. So if you're a member of AD, you can typically read most objects in AD. And there's a reason for that because it allows some functionality within the operating system that's important. But not every piece of data in Active Directory need to have read access to all users, and especially if you're storing uh, sensitive data in that environment. So um, you know, that, that threat, that sort of um, implicit threat of authenticated users having read access to everything is something that you want to think about um, when you're looking at tightening down your Active Directory.
so what can you do about all this stuff? Um, that's, that's really the, the key here is, you know, uh, all of these threats may be known to you or you may have considered them, but the, the, the key is what can I do about them? There's three things that I sort of, uh, you know, three buckets that I kind of categorize the things that you can do around Active Directory, process, automation, and auditing. Um, the process piece is probably the least fun for us technologists, but it's probably the most important. Um, certainly when it comes time to uh, talking to auditors and compliance folks, but absolutely in terms of making everyone clear about you know, how Active Directory should be managed and is managed in your environment. So let's look a little bit about the process. The process is, is um, really, you know, as a starting point, the two main areas that I like to focus on are the account provisioning and deprovisioning process. So um, I, I mentioned that Active Directory is a key player in many organizations, but not the only player. Um, a lot of uh, organizations originate identity. In other words, when somebody is hired either as an employer or a contractor, they're brought into an external system like an HR system or some kind of contractor tracking system. And that's the place where they first exist in the organization. So account provisioning should take into account this sort of workflow of you know, you, new employee coming into the organization, um, originating in the HR system, and somehow making their way to all of the connected systems that require that identity to have access. So uh, if it's Active Directory or if it's um, additional identity stores, maybe you have a meta directory in the organization that has um, fingers touching other applications and systems for authorization and authentication, um, all of that needs to be taken into account in the account provisioning process. Um, so the, 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 when you look at that process, you want to look at it in terms of the identity lifecycle. Um, and I actually talk about this a lot in the ebook that I'm uh, writing associated with this webinar that you can get um, online as well. The, uh, this, this identity life cycle is really kind of the important part about protecting access to AD. It's looking at all the pieces that touch AD, all the processes that touch AD, and making sure that when an account is provisioned, uh, an account is updated, or an account is deprovisioned. Um, in other words, a, a user is uh, no longer in the organization for whatever reason that all of those connected systems are touched and appropriate access is removed. And then, you know, the, the authorization piece of the puzzle, the, uh, if it's in the case of Active Directory, if it's using security groups, that part of the equation is just as important. Um, it, it can be part of the uh, original account provisioning process. So when you uh, provision an account, let's say you're provisioning a new salesperson, that salesperson has access to a set of resources. Maybe it's your CRM application. Maybe it's a, a public file share that contains price lists or whatever it happens to be that is permissioned for the sales users. That, um, that set of uh, authorizations that the sales user has should be part of a well-documented process, um, which includes um, an owner for that um, authorization, in other words, if it's a security group in AD, making sure that you have somebody that's uh, accountable for saying that the people in that group are really the people that need access to those resources. Sort of attestation of that group membership is, is really key as part of this process. So you have this life cycle of no one gets added to a group unless their job function requires it. There's a person that owns the group that knows that that person really has, needs access and there's a kind of a feedback mechanism that says, you know, this, that we check this periodically to make sure that these people still need access. Um, so this is all part of that, the, the, the process piece of getting control of AD. In addition, from a process perspective, um, the other part of the puzzle is protecting AD. So you've got, if you've got a, a good provisioning and deprovisioning process in place, you also want to make sure that you have a good process in place for delegating access to AD. So who has access to change group memberships? Who has access to reset passwords and perform changes to attributes? Uh, if you're using attributes to key business processes, like let's say uh, I have an attribute that says I report to uh, Joe Smith as my manager, and that drives certain business workflows, um, you want to make sure that whoever's updating that, um, that managed by attribute is um, is the right person to do it and has the authority to do it. So having a, um, a solid delegation plan over AD objects and, 
and not not just sort of leaving it to chance because you know let's face it the active directory security model is pretty darn granular and pretty darn complicated if you're not taking kind of a holistic view of it and you're just kind of permissioning one off objects um, that's definitely not a way to go and kind of sort of uh, over time you kind of quickly get into the situation where you just have this mass of ACLs across your AD that are very inconsistent and sometimes even conflicting. So having that delegation plan in place and taking a least privilege approach. Um, you know, my definition of least privilege is um, I only have permissions to do the things that I need to do for my job function. And that holds true for a business user or a systems administrator that's uh, managing Active Directory or managing the servers within Active Directory. And then there's a change process in place. I talked a little bit about this earlier. You have change processes in place for substantial changes to AD. Now what I mean by substantial is um, no one wants to have to open a change ticket and get a you know, seven day approval process to change somebody's um, address in Active Directory, right? So that's, that's obviously that's overkill. Um, but, but you do want to have a change process in place for what are substantial changes to AD, things to uh, privileged um, uh, operations within Active Directory like um, AD replication topology changes or site changes or you know, changes to key attributes that are considered mission critical to the organization. Um, so it should be a real, really a subset of all the things that you're doing in AD day to day but you absolutely want to have that change process in place so that a change that happens doesn't cause um, you know, outages or business functionality to be lost or inadvertent access to sensitive resources. And then a process in place, kind of that feedback loop for alerting and reviewing those AD change audit logs. So I want to know, even, even if changes are happening in AD that I'm not putting a change ticket around, I want to know what's happening so that I can go back forensically or in real time and look and see who made that change and what the change was. So on the automation front, you know, automation is is one of my favorite areas of, of, of discussion because there's a lot of amazing things you can do with automation and uh, and manual steps are nothing that we want to spend our time with, especially if they're done repeatedly. So automation is kind of a key part of, of this whole you know, identity life cycle. And uh, you know, some of these tasks like provisioning and deprovisioning would be very painful if I had to do them all manually. So the ability to, new, to provision a new account automatically, to not have to kick off a manual task when a new record comes into the HR system um, that creates an AD account, creates an exchange mailbox, uh, adds the user to groups, you know, puts them on permissions for uh, different file resources, et cetera. All of that stuff can and should happen automatically as a function of your provisioning process. And in addition, as a function of your change process. You know, if an employee moves um, locations within the organization, um, there's probably a set of tasks that you want to automatically have happen when they move, let's say they move from the New York OU to the San Francisco OU, and um, behind the scenes, what that might mean is you want their mailbox and exchange to move to the San Francisco Exchange server. You want their home directories and public directories that they access to move to the San Francisco file servers um, and potentially other things. You know? So um, having that kind of um, add, move, change process be automated through whatever tool you're using so that um, the user not only gets access to the things that they need as their situation changes, but they're getting an optimized IT experience. They're getting an optimized system experience when that happens. And all that stuff can and should be automated. And then, of course, the deprovisioning part. Um, I, again, this is a key part of any identity management solution is the ability to deprovision an account and all access to that account um, so that the user that leaves the organization is no longer able to uh, perform their job functions and get access to sensitive corporate data. So the way I like to look at this is, you know, kind of stepping through how do I how do I really do this automation? And you know, the ideal scenario is that you can templatize a user's job functions. Um, this is this has it takes a variety of forms. Um, some call it role-based access control, but there's a lot. There's kind of an overloaded uh, list of things within our RBAC that that you have to think about. So what I like to do is think about it in terms of templatizing user job functions. 
So as a, as a new user coming in the organization or as an existing user changing my job role, what do I need to do my job? Yeah, there's a set of um, things that need to happen, group memberships I need to be part of, um, you know, things that have to happen in terms of Active Directory, where I belong in the OU structure, um, who, who, what my attributes have uh, you know, populated within them, those sorts of things. Um, the ability to templatize that so I can say, you know, Joe Smith is a, is a new sales user, and just by virtue of, of having that job function, they get a bunch of stuff automatically. Uh, that's kind of the ideal scenario for where you want to be with this automation. And then, you know, the, um, this automation, what it does for you is it really improves the data in integrity and the chances of, of inadvertent access to uh, resources that they shouldn't have access to. So if you're just kind of, of doing this on a one-off basis um, and you know, doing it with kind of a random set of inputs from various people um, without a good process in place, then you know, there's more chance for that person to be in the wrong groups, to have the wrong access, and, and, for, changes, and for errors to be made. I mean, one of the, the things that automation does for you is it reduces the chances of errors. And if you have a good automation process in place, um, you can almost eliminate errors. And that's, that's where um, you know, looking at this problem holistically and figuring out how you can automate it, things like requests for group membership, uh, approval-based workflow, ongoing attestation of access, uh, delegation of AD objects, um, where they're located in the AD hierarchy and, and how that affects delegation. And then the group policy process, the, this last point that I make here, um, I've talked about this a little bit, but the uh, ability to have a workflow around GPO changes, to have an approved set of folks that can make changes to GPOs, and also the, the pro folks that can review those changes and put them in place. As you probably know, it's fairly easy to make a change to a GPO that can impact an entire organization. If you've got a GPO linked at the domain and you're letting people do willy-nilly changes to that, you're just asking for trouble. So the ability to, to kind of put change control in front of the group policy process, that's one of those areas where you know, I talked about change control of Active Directory operations. That's kind of an area where I think, uh, having worked in group policy for a long time, um, I think it's sort of mandatory that you really have to address this in any decent-sized organization. And then auditing. Um, you know, I've, just, I've got a little screenshot of the, active, of the uh, security log on an Active Directory domain controller. There's a lot of data that Active Directory provides natively out of the box. There's some, some of it's you know, easy to use, some of it's not so easy to use. Um, but having auditing as a feedback loop for uh, good AD management is really critical. Um, auditors and, and uh, security folks are going to expect it and there's no reason why you can't do it. The key is doing it well, um, not getting flooded with uh, events that you're not interested in and that aren't interesting, um, and not capturing those things that are interesting. So uh, you know, having good audit tools in place is, is a key part of this. Um, it, it helps ensure that all of your processes are working, that your automation's working. Um, it kind of warns you if there's something that's amiss, or you know, that occasionally automations will go nuts, and you don't want to see them go nuts without knowing about it. So having auditing is a kind of a safety valve for automations that are not working as expected. And then again, it validates um, unauthorized changes against AD, and it sort of helps uh, keep your auditors at bay in terms of letting them know that you're keeping track of what's going on in your Active Directory. Um, that's that's uh, you know one of the first things auditors are going to ask you is show me show me what's happening. Don't don't tell me you've got a process. Show me that you that you know that the that you have control over AD. So uh, protecting against the threats, you know, uh, tracking several angles of AD usage, uh, who's changing what AD objects, who's accessing key objects, who's logging into AD. All of this stuff is, uh, you know, more or less auditable within Active Directory. Um, and, uh, you know, with additional third-party tools, you can get more visibility and more granularity and more kind of uh, reporting and things like that. But the, the bottom line is you sort of need to know what's going on, what's changing in Active Directory, and who's changing it. So uh, it's, it's useful to know, for example, when um, AD groups are being added to uh, local administrators groups on servers or workstations. So 
I want to know when changes are happening that grant additional access to sensitive resources or privileged access to my systems. Um, I want to know about that because that may or may not be the right thing. And you know, so in terms of what you can audit on, being able to say, you know, look, somebody just added this global group and Active Directory to these 50 servers. Um, why is that? Being able to know that happened is, is pretty critical. And then around delegation, you know, making sure that um, only the people that need to have the ability to change Active Directory can. So uh, AD administrators that need to change AD and related data, you know, only site topology, uh, only administrators that are responsible for Active Directory's configuration should be able to change site topology, should be able to add subnets or, or change replication frequency or things like that. Um, only group policy administrators should be able to change group policy objects. Um, and, and providing kind of an approval-based workflow for critical changes um, and using automation where possible helps to sort of make sure that um, AD, which is kind of this um, backbone for a lot of organizations, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you are in organizations where if AD were to go down, your organization would cease to operate, but I've been in organizations like that, and it's not pretty when AD ceases to operate. So making sure that AD is, um, is rock solid, highly available, you know, is, is part of this landscape in terms of having control over those changes that could affect AD's availability. You know, there's, there's tools for managing AD delegation in the box. They're pretty basic. The delegation and control wizard is a starting point, I like to say, for managing AD delegation. I wouldn't say that it's the be-all, end-all tool, but it, it kind of helps you get started in terms of that, that, you know, getting the right people with access to the, to the right things in AD. But you should absolutely be familiar with, you know, this sort of granular security model that AD provides. Um, you know, you've got um, a lot of different levels of control, not only who can read and write to objects in their properties, but, um, you know, auditing, ownership, all of this stuff plays, as well as the, the hierarchy of AD itself and the inheritance model of permissions. Um, all this plays into, you know, understanding your AD delegation model and really doing it well so that you don't end up having inadvertent access to AD at some low level of your OU hierarchy because the people above you have done crazy things with their, with their security and let it trickle down to your, to your OU. Keep, keeping tight control over group membership, who can change it. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of having a process and or tool in place for uh, doing group policy or group membership changes, um, whether it's self-service group membership changes for groups that really don't have, you know, critical function to having approval-based workflow for group membership changes, um, and then having change control in place for that. I think that's really important um, because a, a groups are used so so much for um, access to resources. And again, auditing is that feedback loop, and, and there's a lot more granular auditing controls within Server 2008, so you're able to, to, to kind of fine-tune what audit data shows up in the, in the Windows um, server audit logs, and which is a good thing because, you know, large organizations quickly get overwhelmed with audit data. Um, so I highly encourage you to take a look at that capability and, uh, and see that you're doing the, the most controlled auditing that you need to do to get that feedback loop. Yeah, enabling auditing on specific AD objects within the ACL editor. Um, so not all objects are automatically audited. Um, even if you turn on auditing, the, the, the system access control list on a particular AD object or objects needs to also be set. So making sure that you've got critical objects in AD set to be audited through that um, auditing tab on the on the ACL editor is is uh, something you got to remember to do. And you know, just a quick word about uh, compliance um, in in this world that we live in with regulations and um, auditors and things. We we have to make sure that um, that we have control over our systems, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it has. Uh, real-world corporate consequences. Uh, if we're a regulated company um, and we let 
customer data out the door because we didn't have a good security model in place on our Active Directory, I guarantee you that's not a conversation you want to have with your officers. Um, so being, being um, really uh, clear about how AD is protected is just absolutely not important, not only important for your own internal security, but also for external security and external compliance. And you know, the bottom line here is that you know, we can't think about AD as a desktop directory anymore. It's simply uh, being used in far too many ways that are critical to an organization. So auditors expect you to have you know, processes in place that show that you're creating a, uh, controlling AD, you know what's happening in AD, you've got audit logs, you, you know your AD configuration, you, you, you have a process, you can show them a process for proper group access to privileged systems or privileged data. Um, it, that, that having, not only having the process, but being able to show you have the process and being able to show that you're able to see when something happens that shouldn't happen um, are all elements that you're going to need to deal with if you're not already dealing with today. So in summary, you know, protecting AD from threats is as, as important as a, of an IT security job as anyone has today. Process automation and auditing are your three friends for this. Knowing your AD security model and, and making sure that you're keeping uh, changes at bay or you at least know when changes are happening and are able to audit against them. And then you know, no one wants to be in the eyes of the auditor or the compliance officer, so making sure that your controls work and that your audits are in place. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Renee, and she's going to continue for us. Thank you very much, Darren. That was very, very interesting. And we've already got a lot of questions coming in, so I'll try to keep this brief. Um, first of all, let's talk about briefly the kind of the real world consequences of a poorly managed, non-secure um, infrastructure, IT infrastructure. And briefly, this is a classic case, as, as you were describing. Uh, this is a gentleman. He was an IT administrator that was fired from Shinogi, um, a Japanese drug company that had um, a subsidiary in the US. Um, he was fired, but they did a horrible job of revoking passwords to their network. So as you can probably see, over the next few months, he was able to gain unauthorized access to their network at will. And he eventually launched an attack a full, full, full five months after he was laid off that basically brought down their entire US infrastructure. He was able to secretly access some software that he installed earlier. He deleted the contents of 15 virtual hosts on their network, which was the equivalent of 88 different servers. And he effectively froze Shionogi's operations for days, leaving company employees unable to ship product, cut checks, or even communicate by email. And they sustained a, about $800,000 worth of losses. Now, the gentleman now faces up to 10 years in prison for his crimes. And they're a key example of how organizations fail to take appropriate and timely actions that protect their critical information after key IT professionals leave. So you may be thinking, well, is this an isolated case? But it's not, because if we look at how the industry is doing, we see that a lot of breaches, a rising number of breaches, involve the accidental or malicious misuse of privileges by insiders. Um, and while Cornish was most certainly an outsider at the time of his crimes, he essentially retained his insider status because Shionogi did a horrible job of protecting access to its networks. And like any cyber criminal that we would normally think of as a quote unquote outsider, he successfully was able to exploit a mistake committed by the victim, hack into the network, and install software on the system to affect data loss and business disruption. Because once an insider gets into your network, you cannot tell them apart from an from a insider. So if you want to, if, you know, when you look at it and you want to assess how secure your current AD infrastructure is from breaches associated with privilege and misuse, you've got to ask yourself several questions. Um, for example, you know, how long does it take you to onboard or offboard a staff member? What's in place to align privileges as staff roles change? How do you ensure separation of duties or enforcement of controls? You know, be because insiders have unlimited access, knowledge, and opportunity. An information security program focused on managing the access and activities of these privileged users can help reduce the incident and the extent of the data loss and business disruption. So at this point, uh, we'd like to get you guys involved. You've heard from Darren, 
And now you've had the opportunity to ask yourself some questions about the security posture of your organization. So um, take a look at these selections. What are your Active Directory management concerns now? You see, um, you can choose all that apply. Are you concerned about secure privilege delegation, centralized auditing and reporting, streamlined provisioning and deprovisioning, automation of repetitive activities? What about policy enforcement? Darren, what, what do you think? What would you expect to see in the poll results? Yeah, that's a good question, Renee. I think, um, you know, if, if I had my druthers, I'd say streamlined provisioning and deprovisioning is what people are, are concerned about. Uh, some of this other stuff um, hopefully is already being done, but, but a mm -hmm. lot of organizations probably aren't yet, don't yet have that streamlined provisioning and deprovisioning process in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we hear that too from our customers because when you're able to, as you were saying, when you streamline that particular processes, it, it not only makes the, you know, ensures the integrity of the data that's going into AD, but it also enforces policy. And that's also, cause it, so it kind of hits across many of these concerns in just one fell swoop. Okay, well, um, let's see the results of that poll. Policy enforcement, okay. Interesting. So hopefully we're, we're going to continue on with the presentation right now. And thank you for your participation. But I think we're going to be addressing many of your concerns as we walk through the rest of the presentation. So. so bottom line, as Darren was saying, you have to have a well-managed active directory environment. It's, it's a must-have just for the, the basic reason that threat, much like hurricanes, you can't eliminate the threat at all but you can mitigate the potential for loss with appropriate security controls that, that are taken across the identity lifecycle of a particular user. I mean, and, and we advocate the same um, security methods and controls that Darren was speaking of, particularly the least privilege approach to controlling access. You know, employees should be given the least amount of privileges to do their jobs for employees, contractors, and partners through, throughout onboarding, throughout their career, and offboarding. This means recertifying when roles aren't changing and having solid termination plans that encompass all areas of access, which, we, as we know, Shianogi did not do. So organizations need an active directory managed solution that delivers detailed, granular access controls above and beyond those that are delivered by native solutions. And as Darren mentioned, automation is also key, especially for provisioning and deprovisioning. And then auditing is key. Uh, you know, a good change management for AD solution should record all administrative activity, store those granular audit events, and provide detailed change analysis, including before and after values of a change, and then providing real-time alerts on the change. So I promised you a case study, so let's jump into a customer that we worked with where we were able to um, affect some real improvements in security and compliance working with them and uh, more business efficiencies. So Energy Energy is a company that's experienced rapid growth in the past few years, mainly because while they started off in wholesale power generation, they purchased Reliant Energy in 2009. And that's a Houston, Texas-based um, retail energy supplier. So now they're physically split between Princeton, New Jersey, and Houston, Texas. And they, have, they went from six customers to over 2 million customers overnight because working with the regional power grid, they had maybe six customers. Now that they're an energy retailer, they've got over 2 million customers spread throughout Texas in the South Central region. So this rapid growth has driven the need to do things better. So while they grew by 50%, they did not grow in IT staff, of course. That's a common complaint. So they needed to know, how are we going to get the same, um, how are we going to get the work done? with the same amount of resources? How can we take those really repetitive tasks or the high volatility processes and start to automate them in order to take those mundane tasks off their plate, in order to have more assurance and when they, that when they perform those volatile processes that have room for error, that the risk was taken out? So they found that by automating the key active directory management activities, they were able to manage the risk. So, the first thing that they told us they needed to do, job one, was to nail down who could do what to who. They had a problem with far too many users with domain, admin, and other administrative privileges. 
So secure delegation of privileges was the foundation that they chose to build everything else on top of. And to achieve this plan, they required a delegation model that will sound familiar by now, that took a least privileged approach to access. They, needed, they got a handle on how many people within the domain forest had administrative privileges, and they started to reduce the number of these people where they could. So they used those granular access controls provided by our, our active directory management solution, and they were able to reduce the domain admin groups from hundreds to a couple dozen. And everybody else, the help desk, support teams, desktop teams, were moved into basic authenticated user roles. Additionally, they were better able to monitor and audit the activities of these users. Be using the solution, they were able to record all administrative activity and the granular audit events. And they got a high fidelity of change information, which answered that who, what, when, where, and how of their Active Directory environment. And this helped them to ensure that they weren't experiencing any unauthorized changes ag against Active Directory. And it also helped them to evidence compliance with SOCs. And finally, NRG took advantage of the product's built-in self-service capability. So when they acquired Reliant Energy, they had faced the task of consolidating all of their employees into one downtown tower in Houston. So what they simply did is put a cheat sheet on every employee's desk, directed them to the self-service portal, which enabled the employees to update basic information about themselves. As a result, a few thousand calls to the help desk were eliminated. So, with, um, so once the foundation was in place, the next requirement that they wanted to address was automated user, automating the user provisioning process. So they had a couple of problems. So first of all, with any team of folks, they saw that there were different interpretations of the same data. So when you automated the solution, it instantly improved the quality of the data going into Active Directory through policies and validation triggers. The other problem was, that with the acquisition of Reliant, they now had three retail call centers that had 100% annual turnover. So with this turnover, with the doubling of employees, they were adding, removing, changing user accounts daily. So by automating their user account provisioning process, they saw immediate value. It was able to give them the ability to control what was going into AD, who was putting it in, and how it was being put in. And it made that process repeatable and consistent. And you know, with the hiring came the firing. And because they had a large number of contractors and those aforementioned call center employees, they needed to provide HR with an easy way to handle disabling a user account without overwhelming the help desk. So what they did is they gave HR the ability to disable user accounts only through their HR console. Once they disabled the account through the HR console, it was turned off in Active Directory completely, and an automation trigger started a workflow that began the process of removing that person from all downstream systems. They found that doing it this way, this automated user deprovisioning helped to close doors that they felt could be easily exploited by insiders posing as someone else, or from even outsiders gaining access to systems via dormant accounts. And finally, I'll just spend a few seconds on this because I know we're running out of time. But um, because they're an energy retailer, they were um, liable to, to the North American Electric Reliability Corporation's um, reliability standards, which um, their mission is to ensure bulk power is available when needed. And the problem they were faced was that they would get frequent bulletins from the NERC team. And at that point, what would happen is their legal and compliance team would send the bulletin out to like 150 different plant supervisors via email. And then once that was done, then began the period of waiting and waiting and waiting for responses. And this was problematic because NERC required response within 24 to 48 hours. So now they chose to automate this process. And now the legal compliance team sends the email directly to the NetIQ solution, the workflow engine, that in turn, it redistributes it to all plant supervisors. And the supervisors reply to the workflow engine. And the workflow engine receives and collates the responses to a single Excel word sheet, and then gives the legal and compliance team updates every 8 to 16 hours, giving them an at-a-glance picture of who's vulnerable and who didn't answer at all. So the solution helps keep them in compliance to NERC and helps them manage those, that time-critical process. 
So in, in summary, our, our best practice approach to helping NRG create that secure and compliant AD infrastructure was an Active Directory Management solution, which we integrated with our best-in-class workflow automation tools. And in the end, they were able to close gaps in security and gain IT administration efficiencies overnight. And they were able to quickly close their audit findings. And they were able to uh, achieve better business results. So this concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. And we want to begin our Q&A session momentarily. So if you haven't already, enter your questions into the console. But I'd like to let you know that at the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll be receiving an email with the link to view today's presentation on demand and that you can share with your friends. And this email will also include the link to download Chapter 1 of Darren Marelia's ebook, Protecting Critical Data by Managing the Active Directory Identity Lifecycle. You'll be even notified as future chapters are completed. But you can also choose to download Darren's book today, Chapter 1 of his book today, by just going to the link that you see there on the screen. And with that, we've got a lot of questions, so let's jump into the Q&A. OK, Darren, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. I see several that say Darren. <laughs> Darren, what is the best practice to terminate an employee in AD? Would it be best to delete them completely or strip access, disable, and move ID to a ghost container? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I've, frankly, I've seen a lot of different approaches. Um, so typically what I see is that the user, is, the user account at the bare minimum is disabled, um, not deleted, because remember that the user has a unique SID or security identifier. And that SID is, is and probably can be associated with a lot of resources in the organization. So you don't want to necessarily delete the account right away. You'd probably want to disable the account. And um, moving it to a, um, a non, what's called a non-production OU um, is something that I have also seen. And, and that's typically that's done uh, as a way of triggering other workflow. Uh, so for example, if I'm in a, um, I think they call it a ghost OU or, or a, a deprovisioned OU, then I can go back afterwards, let's say you know, 90 days after, and I can go and run automation against that OU to say, you know, delete all these accounts because they're 90 days old and they don't belong in there anymore, that sort of thing. So uh, you know, I think that both of those approaches is, is reasonable. Certainly disabling the account as a first step is, is probably the most, uh, is most expedient in terms of preventing access using that account. OK. Sounds good. I've got another question here um, quickly about related to disabling account. Someone wants to know, well, what's the difference between deprovisioning and disabling an account? Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. So if the assumption is that you're disabling an AD account, um, what I think about when I think about deprovisioning is that there, there's a number of things that, an, that a person in an organization has access to, and they may not all be driven out of AD. So there may be other connected systems where they have identities um, that are driven from that kind of larger level provisioning process, and potentially even through other directories, meta directories or other directories in the organization. And so de de deprovisioning really is the removal of all access, regardless of where the identity lives. At least that's how I think about it. Um, making sure that that user, um, everything from, frankly, uh, physical access to a building uh, potentially, you know, using a in, a in a security badge system to uh, to accessing their AD account, to accessing database accounts that they have. Okay, we'll take one more question, Darren, because we're running out of time, and we want to say um, goodbye and thanks to everybody when we get a little time. So the last question is, okay, this is a, it's a little tough one. Account lockouts actually go against Microsoft best policy. Microsoft recommends that we use complex passwords and do not lock accounts. Why the difference in opinion? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, the first thing to note is that Microsoft best policy has changed um, off and on throughout the years. And depending on who you talk to, it's probably different today than it was last week. So I think that the, the, the answer to this question is probably organization dependent. Um, I, I personally am not a I'm not I'm not a big fan of account lockouts, and the reason is that there are ways of exploiting account lockouts that are probably not useful for some organizations. However, um, it can be a way of uh, preventing 
uh, let's say, uh, the, the dictionary type attacks that I talked about, in the absence of really good auditing and controls on being notified when somebody is trying to guess passwords. In other words, they're getting a lot of fail logon attempts. So, th th so my, my favorite solution here is, is having real-time auditing to ensure that you're seeing those kinds of events happening and can react to them. Um, but that being said, a lot of organizations do use account lockout today. And when I've, when I've discussed slash argued this with other people, um, they don't feel comfortable turning off account lockout because it's sort of a, a line in the sand in terms of uh, preventing abuse of accounts. So I, 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 you know, I think that it's really, uh, th there's probably no one answer regardless of Microsoft's best practice or, or, or whatever. It's, it's, I think it's dependent on the organization and their risk tolerance. Okay. All right. That seems that seems like it be a reasonable answer. I mean, it depends on on any organization's level of risk tolerance and how that aligns with their business objectives. So. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, we're sneaking up on the top of the hour, and uh, I guess at this point, what I'd like to say is that we have a couple questions left. But what we'll do is, if you can see up on your screen, um, that you can join us at NetIQ on at uh, Twitter.com, Facebook, or Community.NetIQ.com. And what we'll do is after this uh, webinar concludes, we'll take the questions that were not answered and we'll resolve them there. So just do a search on community.netiq.com on the Darren Morelia webinar and we will respond to the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. So um, at, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and attention today. Um, it was a very informative webinar. We had a lot of questions and, and we appreciate your participation. I see the survey link has gone out, so um, I believe you can continue filling out that survey even after the webinar concludes. So um, thank you very much, everybody.